Yo, hey everybody. Uh, so this is my pivot bolt gravel bike that I've been riding for the last year. I actually got this bike August of 2019 and I did a one video, a little uh, build up and kind of a quick review of it. Um, so this video, we're gonna go over basically everything I think about the bike, pros and cons, and just kind of a basic long-term review, so to speak. Uh, so as it is right now, just checking on Strava this morning, I've got about 70, a little over 7,400 miles on the bike. I'd say probably 80% of that is just commuting to work. I have a 35 mile, approximately plus or minus a few miles round trip commute every day at the bike shop where I work. And um, within the, that, so let's say 35 miles, probably about seven or eight miles of it can be just gravel roads and things like that. So I frequently take those. Um, as far as on the weekends, I may do a long road ride on it or I may just do kind of a combination gravel road. But anyway, uh, originally the bike came set up with knobby tires. Um, it was a Maxxis Rambler, which was a 40, uh, 40 millimeter width tire as it is right now. I've got some just Schwalbe's that I took off somewhere. It's just a slick tire, 32 millimeters wide. Um, so that's generally what I use to ride with it. Even on gravel, dirt, pretty aggressive off-road stuff. I've just ridden the slicks there. So that's uh, all that stuff has worked really well for me. Um, the bike's pretty grungy right now. I usually, you know, probably get some flack for that, not having it all dolled up and looking pretty, but you know, it's just kind of real world what it looks like most of the time. So a few different uh, build kit options as far as if you get the complete bike from Pivot. Um, this pro there's a Shimano GRX uh, DI2 version and then there's the uh, Team Force version which is a one by force axis um, with the flat top force chain road group and then it's got a 10 33 cassette you can have all well you can have the option of uh, the axis the eagle axis rear derailleur and then an eagle 1050 cassette so just you got either one of those options um, I will say that the uh, the initial setup on this one which had a 36 tooth front ring and then the 1033 on the rear I found that 36 was for me was just a little bit too kind of more towards the low low end range of the bike so it was fine for climbing pretty much everything for me but top end wise if you're in a you know doing some gravel events or you're trying to ride with some guys on road bikes in a group and you know you might find that anything over 25 miles an hour or so starts to get hard to keep up because you're just spun out basically so um, one thing I did was added the I added a 42 tooth uh, chain ring, which that seemed to work out. It's a pretty good compromise, a little better higher end. And to me, it's um, you know with that 42 and then the 33 in the rear, it's not much different than how I had most of my road bikes geared with the 53, 39, and a 28 in the rear. So that, that's not a huge deal. Um, one thing that SRAM did come out with, they do now have a 1036 in the axis road components so that's just another option if you wanted a little more low end uh, to it to add to it there or you can you know again just do the axis eagle stuff so you kind of do a electronic mullet um, setup as well that's easy you know the shifters are going to talk to a mountain bike derailleur there's no special adapters or modifications you have to make in that case so some of the places i've actually ridden on the bike is uh you know other than bike paths things like that and gravel trails that um some of the places where i commute and whatnot i've taken it on some pretty epic um really more mountain bike trail type rides and uh um, just some long uh, road rides in the mountains stuff like that just basically putting miles on it in all really all conditions that's I think where this bike shines the best is it is a great 
all conditions bike as far as the the geometry on it is pretty neutral it does the rear end is a it's 400 or it's 42 centimeter rear end there so it's close it's getting you know it's pretty close to a what you would find on an actual road bike versus uh um you know typically what you'll see on um most gravel bikes and then it does have quite a bit of clearance for uh bigger fatter tires um i know you can run a 650b wheel with up to a 50 millimeter wide tire and then with these 700 c wheels uh, you can run up to a 47 millimeter wide tire so uh, you know that's nice but it also works really well i would say with these wheels that came on it probably this 32 is going to be about the narrowest i would put on it but it feels very light uh super stable i've taken it down some um you know had it over 40 miles an hour numerous times just going down some mountain twisty mountain passes and things like that and this this com you know com uh, combined with the uh the hydraulic disc brakes it's you know if that's not something you've ever tried it's definitely a very confident riding um, bike going at speed down some twisty corners and stuff like that kind of just overall the uh the pros on this bike um that i things i really like about it is just the overall ride quality and it's got the uh, isoflex decoupler thing here in the in the seat seat tube the seat post uh, interface it, so it kind of isolates the seat tube or the seat post from the actual frame there's a kind of a elastomer hard rubber piece that kind of goes in between that has some give to it so it's not as flexible as say you know the ones that come on the tracks like a iso speed decoupler but it's definitely you can feel it as far as rough roads vibration-y gravelly type stuff it definitely deadens those high frequency vibrations kind of cancels those out as it you feel it through your seat there um, but the frame otherwise you know it's very comfortable for doing really long rides on but at the same time it's you know, you've got this massive bottom bracket that's um, it's, it's based off of bb the 386 evo um, interface so the bearings fit at the very furthest edge as possible um, this one it uses a dub the dub crank so it's a 20 essentially a 29 millimeter crank um, you know when I first got the bike one thing I kind of vowed I was never going to do was run another BB30 press fit 30 uh, crank bottom bracket type system just because I've had a few of those on some different bikes and it's just ended up you know you're always chasing creeks which is another story for another day but I've got some videos on kind of some of that how to fix it but anyway I was worried this was going to be an issue on this bike uh honestly it never has been i've never had any any kind of noises or creaks or i've had the chain off and this thing still spins super smooth um feels like butter so no issues with that dub interface um but yeah i'd say just overall the ride quality of the bike the simplicity of the shifting on the uh axis one by setup is you know you just upshift on one lever downshift on the other so it's super super uh, intuitive and easy to shift there's plenty of versatility in whatever drivetrain options you want to run versus you know whether you want to do a di2 you want to do wireless access you want to do mechanical there's bits and plates and everything and adapters for all of that um, you know if you want to run a double up front there's a it comes with the uh a, basically a bolt-on uh, braze on there that you mount your derailleur to or it's just got the block off plate if you want to, if you're going to do a one by uh so it's super versatile uh, as far as that goes it's got lots of accessory mounts for your you know inside of here there's rack mounts fender mounts underneath it comes with some extra little brackets you can put on it's got two bottle mounts it's got mounts on top for a like a bento box or your stuff like that i've got one of those it's kind of just a, i think that's a pretty standardized bolt location now that folks are using on those just right out of the box it's got really nice components there's really nothing to 
that you're going to have to upgrade to make it a race worthy bike you know just add your pedals and cages and whatever other accessories you're going to run you know pedals are something that's pretty um, i just run road pedals on mine but you know you can put whatever you want on it that's kind of a personal preference um, but that's um, you know overall i'd say i'd give it a probably a nine or a 9.5 out of 10 um, just overall but uh, there are a few cons that you know maybe things i don't necessarily like some are just what they are and some are easily to easy to rectify but um, so probably the main con I can think of on the bike is just the, uh, the overall cost um, this one retail cost on the uh, on the Axis Force version either one with the Eagle or just the standard Force Road system is uh, right at seven thousand dollars or sixty nine ninety nine the uh, GRX version is uh, fifty-two ninety-nine, um, so it is—it's not a cheap bike for sure. Um, but you know, I think it's—it is well engineered, and it's obviously will hold up long-term wise. I mean, in my opinion. Uh, so the second thing, I made a video about this, but the uh, the uh, brake hose as it runs through the frame. Uh, it, Specifically here in the down tube, it was just laid in there and it was, you know, slapped around. After I did one gravel event that was had some pretty gnarly washboards, and by the end that cable had kind of, you know, you can cinch it down within the little plates, but it still had managed to work its way, and I could never get it to not slap around and uh, hit the bottom of the the down tube there. So. Um, made a video on just how to put the Jaguar. There's a little uh, insulation tube that you just slide over that, and ever since then it's never made a peep as far as any of that. So that was easily easily fixable, but would kind of be nice if the, you know if they're going to route the cables and everything for you on the initial build. They you know it would be nice to have that installed as well. Um, so the next thing is, you know, after I had it about a month, I did notice some creaking and things. And, you know, first thing, it's like, ah, oh, it's that dang, you know, that dub bottom bracket. I knew that thing was going to creak eventually, you know, pull that apart, you know, put it back together, cleaned it up and did my normal things to, uh, stop the creaking on a typical BB30 or a press fit 30 crank and bottom bracket interface and still was creaking. So eventually come to find out it's just the, uh, the through axles just every so often where the you know the through axle and then the the end caps where they rest in the frame you just have to pull that it's basically all of that interface um you know i'm not sure if it's the end caps into the frame or the through axle but occasionally maybe once a month it'll kind of hear some creaking you just pull that apart wipe it all down you know usually i'll put a little film of grease on the through axle itself put it back together and it's gone till next time. So that's just kind of a tip, you know, I just kind of classify that as a quick little maintenance thing that you have to do every so often just to keep it from creaking. Um, but yeah, I've noticed it on the front and rear through axles. Either which way, that would be another little con. And then the next, you know, is was the gearing that, you know, as it was straight out of the box, that was kind of a big complaint I've heard as far as some people feel the gear's not low enough or high enough. Um, you know, I feel like if you pick your the right chain ring, then it's, you know, it's not a huge deal as far as, you know, if you need a bigger range, you know, then you could just go with an Eagle, Eagle cassette. Um, but yeah, I mean, personally for me, I haven't had a problem with having enough range on this and I'm riding it, you know, elevation wise. I do I probably have, 13, 1400 feet of climbing every day and some pretty steep little digger hills. I don't, I'm, you know, I don't really, I pretty much go through the full range, use all the gears, but it's, I don't, I don't feel like it's been under or over geared as soon as I pick this, put this uh, 42 tooth uh, chain ring on it. And, okay, so one little bonus as far as back to the, the pros list um, with this axis stuff, primarily the the flat top chain, the uh, wear wise and everything. So I had just under 5,000 miles when I had uh, switched the um, 
the chain ring and the chain and everything and so I was you know like oh, I probably smoked this chain anyway I need to you know it's beyond time to replace it and then upon measuring it you know even taking the L chain off holding it right up against the new chain it was barely worn at all and that's after 5,000 miles so I, I mean I've never had pretty much every bike I've had you know 9 10 11 speed previously it's I would say on average I'm getting I'm getting like uh, maybe two to four thousand miles somewhere within that range just depending on what type of riding I'm doing and conditions and everything else that's about what I would max that I was getting out of a chain and so just seeing this one held up to a new chain you know I measured it and I was like well this can't be right you know these are the rollers are a little bigger so it is different measurement process but um, I've got one of the little park tools the new ones that you are designed to measure the 12 speed flat top road axis chains and it sure enough it barely showed any wear at all and holding it up to the new chain it I barely had any wear the chain ring the old chain ring still looked good so I you know I had to put a new chain on obviously to compensate for the bigger chain ring but um, you know it's still still got the original cassette on here and it's you know even though this thing is in super grungy condition which it typically is I was for sure that other chain was going to be smoked but you know I don't know I don't know if anybody else is having a similar I'd, I'd love to hear about it but from my experience these chains are wear wise are uh, much better than anything I've ever ridden ever um, on top of that it does, it shifts as far as I've built quite a few bikes that have this SRAM force axis and red um, that one by setups and then two by setups and from what I found the front shifting on them isn't great it's it's doable it's probably not in the same category as the DI2 as far as if you're comparing electronic shifting but as far as this rear shifting um, I think it's it, it's as smooth as anything out there shift wise uh, you know some people say well it's a, it doesn't shift as quick as di2 but I mean I don't, I don't know I can't I've ridden plenty of di2 bikes I've got a mechanical bike and to me it's you know you push the button it pops right into gear so uh, I don't know I've never had any issues with feeling like it was shifting too slow for me um, never had any chain drops never had any weird malfunctions um, I have however let the battery die on me a few times you know just forgets forget to charge it I mean it's pretty easy because you can just look down and anytime you shift it you'll see the little LED come on you know you have to charge these I would say probably every month or two maybe is about average um, but yeah I've definitely let it uh, just run out of battery juice a few times on riding to work but uh yeah that's that's really the only issue i've had with with the axis stuff so yeah hopefully you enjoyed the video um yeah overall i'd say i'm really pleased with the bike it's been a fun bike probably going to be selling it here in the next uh few weeks and moving on to something else um but yeah, anyway, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Uh, please consider subscribing to my channel. I'm always putting out videos, reviews, tutorials similar to this or whatever. And uh, yeah, it's gonna do it for this video. Thanks for watching.